If I ask you to sum up the history of the Old Testament, I wonder what you would say of where you would go to first. In particular, if I asked you to think about the history of God's dealing with the Jewish people. Maybe you'd start with Abraham, you know, get up out of this land to a place that I will show you. Then you, maybe you'd focus on their time in Egypt, the exodus with Moses, then their period when they were ruled by judges, then maybe kings, the, divided, the dividing of the kingdom, various exiles, returns, good kings, bad kings, etc., etc. Something, something, Jesus comes along. Well, much more articulately, that's the approach that Stephen takes, isn't it, in the book of Acts. And if you want to find probably the best uh, sort of rundown of the historical narrative of the history of the Jewish nation, Acts chapter 7 is the place to go. No one gives that summary better than Stephen does. Or maybe you would go into the detail of the deal that God made with the Jews and the Moses. And you would look at the particulars of... Uh, the Mosaic law and how the sacrifices were to be done. And if you were feeling clever, you could then explain how what we have in Christ is so much better. How we don't need priests. We have Christ as our mediator. We don't need re relentless sacrifices as we have the Lord Jesus Christ once for all sacrifice. Well, that approach to Jewish history is what Paul does in his letter to the Hebrews. <coughs> oh, sorry, the writer. So I'm always doing that. The writer to the, to the Hebrews. And that little letter is the linchpin of our understanding of how the whole Bible ties together old and new covenants. Or maybe if among us you're a total fantasist, you'd like to make up your own history of the Jews. That's quite popular. Maybe you'd like to claim that sort of Africans are the true Jews and, you know, the Jews that are there who claim it, you know, they're some other imposters. That's what the black Hebrew Israelites do. Or maybe you'll claim that they escaped to South America and were called Lamanites or something like the Mormons. Well, this parable, I'd say, is the Lord Jesus Christ's own summation of the history of the Jews. He doesn't give a kind of in-depth, you know, and in the 50th year of this king, this happened. He sort of gives the uh, moral arc of the Jews and their dealings with God. That's basically their history laid out there, planted in a vineyard, killing his servants over and over again. And so this evening we're going to look at that, we're going to see what it's saying, and why Christ says this at this time, because this is right on the back of what we heard about last week, where he's disputing with the scribes and the religious leaders about his authority and them challenging it. Then we'll look at the conclusion of the Jewish nation in the Lord Jesus. And then we'll finish with what our response to that should be. And to do that, we'll look at the response of the leaders in his own time. So let's start in verse 1. What I've got to say probably won't be terribly long this evening. We probably have lots of time left at the end. As an interesting historical aside, uh, it wasn't uncommon when the Puritans were around for there to be a Q&A time after the, after the sermon. I'm not proposing that, but it's interesting what they did in different eras. But uh, maybe we'll have a time of prayer. So, starting in verse 1. A man plants a vineyard. It is his. He owns it. A certain man planted a vineyard. And it appears that he invested a lot inside this vineyard. It's not just your normal run-of-the-mill vineyard, you know, some rubbish you'll find in the Loire Valley in France. No, this is a, it's got all the mod cons. It's got a tower for protection. It's got protective hedging. It's even got uh, a wine press in it. Or as in the Baptist translation of the Bible, the grape juice maker 3000. It's even got one of them inside it as well. Digged a place for the wine vat, built a tower. And then it says, he let it out to some people, to some husbandmen. Wow, what a deal. Imagine signing on that lease, getting that brand new vineyard. Happy days, luxury vineyard. And the meaning here, I'll tell you the meaning as we, as we go along, is this is God establishing a nation and a people to live in a land which, 
is a luxury vineyard that flows with milk and honey. But it's not just that, it's a people to whom he has given all the benefits of his word, his law, a full counsel for how they should live, and a covenant as well that he has made with them. This is God's establishing the Jewish people, their place in his plan, in his providence. That's what's happening there in verse 1. And then what happens next in verses 2 to 5? He sends a servant to receive the fruit so he can fulfill the purpose that that vineyard was made for. But they suddenly don't want to play ball. They beat the servant and throw him out. And he sends another one and they do it again, but worse. He does another one and they kill this one. And on and on it seems to go. Verses 2 to 5, we see a series of escalations where to collect that fruit, the owner can't. These servants that he sends don't seem to be able to manage the tenants or the husbandmen of the vineyard. They suffer immense violence, don't they? They rebel against the owner and the landlord, and they believe that they can take the vineyard for themselves. And instead of being grateful of working diligently and abiding by the terms of that lease that they had, they rebel. And of course, we know what this meaning is, don't we? This is referring to Jewish Old Testament history. The people were always rebellious and stiff-necked. Even when Moses was on Sinai getting the law, they were busy making idols for themselves. They continually believed that they could do without God. He gave them judges, but yet everyone persisted in doing that which was right in their own eyes. God gave them kings to lead them, only for the kings themselves to forsake God and to lead the people astray. And of course, God sent them innumerable prophets, only for them to be variously ignored, imprisoned, or even martyred. This is Jesus' indictment of the history of the Jewish religious life. And so like those husbandmen, the Jews do not fulfill the purpose of their being in the land or in the vineyard, as it were, and having that covenant and that word from God. They do not fulfill the various deals made with Abraham, Moses and David and be a light to the Gentiles and a God's own inheritance. Instead, they seek to take what God has given them and keep it for themselves and live without reference to him. So that's verses 1 through to 5. And then something slightly different happens in verse 6. The Lord of the vineyard changes his tack. He does something slightly different. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved son, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. Now in the parable, this is speaking up to Christ's present age. And I think we can guess who Jesus is talking about when he speaks of the tenant's son. And we might say, well, that's a nice thought, isn't it? Sending your own son, you know, that'll really, that'll really clamp down on things. But these husbandmen are so wicked that what do they do? Do they listen to the son? Was the Lord of the vineyard right? No. They've so persisted in their rebellion against the Lord of the vineyard that they reject and kill him too. Their final and ultimate act of disobedience. And so then what's the answer? What is left? What options are now available to the Lord of the vineyard? Having suffered the loss of his own son. He doesn't even have anyone to pass on his vineyard to anymore. Well, they've got to go, haven't they? These tenants, they're beyond the pale. And so he will destroy them. And then he will seek to let out that vineyard to someone else. And we see that in verse 9. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandman and will give the vineyard unto others. So at this point, it's clear that Christ is speaking of himself and the events which are shortly to take place there in Jerusalem. 
for his own death at the hands of the religious leaders. And we're going to explore further uh, what that means in just a minute. But first, I've got some observations on what we've read on the text and what it says about God and his historic dealings with his people that we read throughout the Old Testament. The first thing that we see is the kindness of God. His kindness to the Jews at first, didn't we? We saw the, uh, the quality of the vineyard that he had made. There was nothing obliging God to deal so kindly with the Jews at first. He was under no obligation to rescue them from the yoke of the Egyptians. Think of the spectacular way in which he did that. The way in which he sent manna from heaven, a fiery pillar during the night and the cloud during the day, and even giving them the law. This tells us that God is immensely kind, immensely gracious. And you know, that is good news to us this evening. This tells us that God is kind and he loves to bless us, even a people unworthy as all of you gathered here this evening. The second thing that we see, I think, and this is really something that comes across, it's, it's almost the main theme, is God's almost, it seems, unreasonable amount of patience that he has. As we've compared the likeness of sending servant after servant to these husbandmen and God sending prophet after prophet to call his people back, to restore them to the right way, to walk and follow the light and the truth, they just don't do it. But yet he continually is patient with them. Servant upon servant, prophet upon prophet. And when we read the history of the Old Testament, we see that he tarries with them for thousands of years. Through exiles and restorations and everything that happens, he continually is patient with them. But again, a little bit like with God's kindness, although uh, to us, or certainly to me seeming this, the patience of God did come across as, a, as an almost irrational level of impatience. It is something else that is to our gain. God is patient with us as well, isn't he? He's patient with us feeble people as we live our Christian lives. Always sinning, always failing, and yet always welcoming us back. Always delighted to hear our prayer always delighted to work in us and use us. God is patient with sinners as well, isn't he? Giving them lots of opportunity to come to Christ. Not just forsaking people, leaving people, but he has his people, the church here on earth, to be his voice to call the nations to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ. How many decades has the open-air work been going on in Leicester? God is patient with sinners. The gospel call going out century after century, calling people to repent. And finally, God is patient with the world in delaying the coming of Christ. It's often tempting to think when you look out there, you know, I would have, I would have called it a day on this a long time ago. But God doesn't, and it's not that he is uh, like the Lord of the vineyard. He's gone into a far country, you know, he's, he's disappeared off. He's tending his other planet of aliens on Mars or whatever. It's not like that. It is God's patience towards this planet, his own creation. But of course, one day he will come back. And we see that in the vineyard as well, don't we? That one day he will return and have his last word. He will have judgments upon all people and my final observation and this is also pretty obvious really is that human beings really are evil aren't they it would be wrong to suggest that this rebelliousness was in some way unique to the jews there was nothing special about the jews when he chose them they are as sinful as any other group of human beings, of British people, or ex definitely the French people, for instance. It would be wrong to suggest that it was unique to them. 
And if we search our own hearts and look out into our world, we will find the same thing, won't we? An unlimited capacity for pride, selfishness, ingratitude and violence, which we see in abundance with these wicked tenants, and a very limited capacity indeed for humility, gentleness and self-control. You could say, putting these husbandmen, these tenants, in this vineyard, it was never going to end well, wasn't it? You can almost envisage that this would have been the outcome. And you can almost say the same with the Old Testament, looking at the history of the Jews, a people totally unable to keep the royal law that was given to them. It's like trying to make a cow bark or a pig fly. It's just not going to happen. And what we can see from here is that we need a redeemer. We need a new nature. We need someone to remake us, to give us a new, I've said a new nature, to become completely different creatures. And otherwise, if we do not have that, we will meet the same sticky end as these wicked tenants. So this brings us nicely back round, really, to uh, to in what way Christ is the Son in this parable. And it's obvious that Jesus, being the Son of God, is the Son of the Lord of the vineyard in here. And the people that he was delivering this message to, they knew that he was talking about them, that they were the wicked tenants. And so what is he saying here? Why does he give this in this time and place? He is warning the religious leaders, the one that we were disputing with last week, the ones who were challenging his authority, who do not believe him, who are blind and cannot see that this is the Messiah that God has sent. He's telling them and warning them of the position that they are in. He's saying to them, you've rejected all the prophets. I am your last chance to assuage the judgment of God on your nation. Believe in me or God will destroy you. And of course, they don't listen, do they? And the vineyard, the covenant and the promises made with them passes on to the Gentiles in the new covenant in Christ, which is open not just to the Jews, but to all people. If you'll notice in the parable, the uh, son dies and the people are judged, but it kind of ends there. But the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't leave it there. He doesn't predict his own inglorious demise uh, to simply own the scribes and Pharisees as he's talking to them. He then quotes a prophecy, a promise from the book of Psalms, and then claims that it will be fulfilled in himself. And it is Psalm 118, quoted in verses 10 and 11. And have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. What he's saying there in quoting that is, Not only am I I your last chance to stave off judgment, but your rejection and murder of me will in fact be my ultimate triumph. These religious leaders, the elite of Israel, would unwittingly be the means that God would use to satiate his wrath against sin. As Christ on the cross where they put him, reviled and rejected, was carrying away the transgressions and the iniquity of his people. He was, in effect, creating new tenants for the vineyard. He is the stone which the builders rejected. He came to his own and his own received him not, it says at the beginning of John's Gospel. So then, of course, we've got Christ rejected, the builders didn't want the stone, as it were, the tenants killed the son of the owner of the vineyard, 
the Lord Jesus Christ died upon that cross. He was the sacrifice for our sins. He bore our guilt and our shame. But death could not hold him. It had no claim on him as he himself was sinless and bore the sins of his people. Therefore, having no sin, he came back from the dead. The father accepted that sacrifice and he could rise again from the grave. And so this man, Jesus, who is telling them that parable then and there, in space and time, physically, would come back to life with warm breath in his lungs and a beating heart. You could take his pulse. They killed him and they failed. And this triumph over his enemies and over sin and over hell, this glorified eternal body he now enjoys and his exaltation is him becoming the head cornerstone. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And it goes on, it says, this was the Lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes. It was his plan all along. It's what the elders of Israel meant for evil and God meant for good. And just before we move on, just to elaborate a little on the meaning of a, and the imagery of a cornerstone, just in case it's not clear, you shouldn't assume everyone is always familiar with all of these things. A cornerstone is used at the base of two walls to bind them together and to make them strong. It is the foundation, as it were, the one by which the other stones will be measured and placed Everything subsequently depends on that first cornerstone. They thought they were rejecting him. They thought they were rejecting the stone to make that building, that temple. But actually they were putting him in the most important position of all. And what is that building? What is that temple which is built upon Christ as the foundation, as the chief cornerstone? It is his people, the church, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So far, what have we seen then? That this parable of these wicked tenants is a metaphor for the waywardness of God's people in the Old Testament. But you needn't confine it to that. There is, uh, the metaphor holds true if you broaden it out to all of sinful humanity. God who created a perfect world, like the luxury vineyard in verse 1. And there are people who have rejected him and gone astray. So it's the waywardness of the people. We have seen how uh, that persisted into Christ's own day and culminated in his own death at their hands. And we've seen how that death was not in any way a failure, but was actually the key point in God's reconciling all things to himself and is the basis of a better covenant with all the peoples of the world. And at the same time as being all of that, it is the seal of judgment upon his own people who rejected him. And dare I say, he even foretells their destruction in AD 70 when the temple would be destroyed and the Romans would disperse the Jews into a diaspora across the world for the next 2,000 or so years. And so finally, that leaves us with one remaining verse, verse 12. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. And they left him and went their way. So after having heard all of what we've seen this evening, what was the reaction of the religious leaders? They wanted to arrest him. They wanted, really, to kill him. And there's no small amount of irony here. That after being told that if they kill Christ, he'll become the chief cornerstone and it'll result in the desolation of their own nation, they persist. 
In effect, they want to kill him for foretelling that they will kill him. How hardened in sin were the rulers of Israel at that time? Not pausing to think about what he had said, but reacting. And from the parable itself, that was the inevitable conclusion as they got worse and worse and worse. As Christ has said, you know, you didn't believe the prophets, so you don't believe me. Or rather, if you believe the prophets, you would believe me. He says to them in Matthew 23, you are the children of those who killed the prophets. So let's finish with some warnings and some encouragements. Warnings. Don't be like the religious leaders here uh, in this parable. Do not harden your hearts. Do not persist in unbelief and rebellion. Listen to God's servants. Do not try to kill them. And we should take the Old Testament people uh, broadly as a cautionary tale of how not to do things, of what, of, what, of what does not work, a system that was broken. It's bad news for any theonomists in the congregation this evening. Otherwise, you will end up like the religious leaders in the parable, in the fires of hell and under the wrath and curse of God. So with those warnings, what are the encouragements? That doesn't sound like there's much encouraging that arises from the parable. Well, wouldn't it be great if instead of being destroyed, instead of persisting in our sin and unbelief, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could get in on Christ's work that we've heard about, on him becoming the chief cornerstone? Think of all the things that we've spoken of in this brief time this evening. Resurrection from the dead, the taking away of sins and its legal curse, being planted in a luxurious vineyard, reconciled to God, triumph and exaltation. The Lord Jesus Christ has achieved these things, but I wonder if there is a way for us to get them too. If only there are a way that we could somehow be joined with Christ in such a way that he would share all of those benefits and good things with us. Well, incredibly, praise God, we can. We can be united to the Lord Jesus Christ through faith, even today. You, gathered here in Counterstorp in the end of 2022, can enjoy union with the same man that spoke this parable and did those things then. Put your trust in him. Come to him and ask. Confess your sins, then forsake them and throw yourself on Jesus Christ for forgiveness. He will gladly have you and love you. After all, think of the disposition of the Lord of the vineyard. Let's go back and think about that patience. He's waiting. He's patient. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not cast you out. His intentions, the Lord of the vineyard, was always for reconciliation. It was always to get back on, on good terms with the husbandman and for them to be on good terms with him. The Lord of the vineyard was committed to making that relationship, that agreement that they made, he was committed to making it work. He was patient with them. He sent servants to them. Have no fear. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to be reconciled. He will be reconciled if you come to him. He will gladly have you and love you. And let us lastly just look at verse 6 one last time. The Lord of the vineyard, having therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sends him also last unto them. They will reverence my son. The Lord of the vineyard, he thought very highly of his son. He loved his son. One can only imagine the grief he would have suffered when he was murdered. In the parable, that is the love that God has for his son, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And that love that God has for him is yours through union with Christ. It is yours in him if you would come to him this evening, as I have encouraged you to do. So let us therefore worship and give thanks to our Lord and strive to be faithful husbandmen of his vineyard. Amen.